All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Teletalk. A uh, quick note, this webinar is being recorded. So by attending, you're consenting to this recording. Uh, I'm Stacey Stubblefield. I'm one of the co-founders of TeleSign, and I'm joined today by Cameron D'Ambrosi, who is Managing Director for One World Identity. And also joining us is one of my teammates here at TeleSign, Ibru Keskin, our resident identity and fraud expert. Cameron and Ibru want to say hi to the group. Hi everyone. So um, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Some of you may actually know me if you're in the UK and the EMEA region. I have been working with the e-commerce space for the last 12 years, specifically for and payments. And I've been with Telesign for a few months now. So just revisiting this exciting topic of PSD2. Uh, hi everyone, Cameron D'Ambrosi, uh, Managing Director at OWI, also host of the State of Identity podcast. If uh, you're in the identity space, my voice sounds familiar. Uh, love talking about digital identity in all its forms, so uh, really excited for a, a fantastic conversation, and thanks to Stacy and the Telesign team for having me today. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for your intro. Cameron, you sound uh, like you have a podcast set up there, very uh, <laughs> professional sounding. Okay. So today we're gonna to be talking about how regulations such as PSD2 can be seen as an opportunity to improve your business model rather than just a checkbox on your to-do list. So we really want to um, optimize you know, what you're working on. So a quick note here, Telesign is not an authority on PSD2. We don't have any control or influence over the terms of the regulation. Our Teletalk series is geared towards sharing our insider information and perspective on all things having to do with fraud and security. We've taken an interest in PSD2 because it runs adjacent to our security and identity solutions, and we're passionate about protecting businesses and their customers, so we support any technology that helps to accomplish this. Before we get started, I want to note that the Q&A session is open for submissions at any point throughout the session, so don't be shy. We'll try to incorporate questions into the live discussion, so please jump in. All right, let's get down to it. So I am going to make a statement that might be a little bit controversial, and then I would love to hear your uh, both of your reactions to it. So. The statement is, regulation should not be seen as a barrier, but as an opportunity. So PSD2 uh, not only protects consumers, but it also protects the integrity of your business. So really, you know, let's get away from thinking of these regulations as, you know, annoying things that need to get done. And instead, let's see them as really opportunities for our business. What do you guys think about that statement? Do you think of regulation as a burden or do you think of it as an opportunity? And either of you can jump in. Well, uh, Ibru, go ahead. No, you go ahead, you go first. <laughs> sure, so I, I mean, I think uh, more broadly, uh, obviously regulation in general can take many forms, um, but if we're gonna channel this kind of around um, PSD2, I think, by and large, from my perspective, uh, it's a fair statement to say that PSD2 is both protecting consumers and protecting the integrity of businesses. I think especially uh, the guidelines around secure customer authentication um, are steps that I would recommend that any of our clients take um, when you think about what the expectation is to make sure that a transaction actually is being uh, you know, undertaken by the person who initiated it, who owns that account, as opposed to a fraudster. Um, PSD2 really hits on, in many ways, kind of the bare minimum of steps that I would expect leading organizations to be taking in terms of protecting their customers. Um, so from that perspective, I think it is not a barrier. It is um, maybe a helpful nudge in the right direction from regulators. And I think that um, making sure that you can comply um, is obviously good uh, policy, but also your customers will appreciate the fact that you are protecting their accounts. And I think the difference between organizations that are going to see success under these regimes and the organizations that struggle, um, it is down to one, your implementation, you know, are you using the right technologies for the challenges you're facing? And then two, communication, you know, making sure that your customers understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I think consumers um, across markets, whether it's the EU or globally, um, communicating with them in plain English um, to 
really let them know like, Hey, this is why we're doing this. This is what um, it is doing. And this is the benefit to you as a consumer. Like, Hey, we're keeping your account safe and making sure that your money isn't being stolen. Uh, I think folks really end up actually appreciating that and understanding that this is not an inconvenience. Um, This is a positive thing uh, that's protecting them as consumers. Yeah, I absolutely agree with all of that. Um, In terms of my perspective of what I think about the regulation since the start has been that it's a positive and necessary step in the right direction. Um, Quite often um, companies, I understand that there's a lot of burden uh, in terms of paperwork and regulation. There's lots of work to be done. There's a lot of costs that are incurred. And and I know that these aren't to be taken lightly. So um, lots of consultants and legal consultants, lots of terms and conditions and process change. However, looking back at that, we've been discussing all of the regulation and the restrictions for years now. And so I'm trying to like um, put a fresh perspective on this. So now we've done the bare minimum, we worked through all of that legal paperwork, which was painful. I was included in all of that with a few merchants myself. And at first it felt like a massive burden for the company. But beyond all of that, why did this regulation come about? And I believe that a lot of regulation always follows a need. There was something missing in the industry globally. And when I refer to the industry, I guess I'm talking about e-commerce and the digital space and just our online world where we're transacting, where we're doing a lot of business online. I think this space needed a lot of regulation, which was missing. So, you know, in our day-to-day lives, there's a lot of laws that protect us and govern us across all of the world and where we've united online and it's in a global capacity, we realize that we're actually, we're allowing crime to happen online. We're providing lots of opportunities for criminals to take advantage of lots of people in this entire process, including just the card holders and the payment holders and banks are suffering too and everybody along the line and it feels like it's something that people didn't want to have accountability for you know online fraud felt like the perfect crime for a while and even now look at how much it's grown exponentially it's growing along with online sales so during the last year we've seen an unimaginable world we didn't anticipate coming maybe some did but we've seen a growth of over 200% in the online domain across all sectors across the world where there's internet and connectivity. But alongside that, we've seen fraud grow at the same rate successfully. And I say successfully, a lot of people have turned to fraudulent businesses as a lucrative income. And I believe that we have a social responsibility online where we're not very well governed to create regulations, to adhere to the regulations that these um, payment companies and all these security companies are suggesting very strongly now. So that's what PSD2 is a very strong suggestion towards taking charge of the business you've created online, which is wonderful. But how about all of the crime you're enabling? I think that we have a social responsibility to prevent that. And I think PSD2 gives an opportunity for our online and offline worlds to merge. And I can tell you that that actually there's been surveys done in terms of global trust in, um, so global trust inequities. So, so they've done a study just to find out what, what people feel. And a lot of people feel over 61% of people globally feel that the digital space is renovating very quickly and governments aren't able to catch up. And so PSD2 is a regulation that was a suggestion. We've done the bare minimum, but I think now it's an exciting time opportunity for this to be passed on to another department. So there to be innovation, to be more consideration around this. And I think, like I said, again, it it follows a need. A lot of um, companies weren't following best practices and hoping for the best while trading online. And we realized that it, it's just too idealistic. We, we didn't have enough protection from all of the possible fraud um, scams that are running online. And everyone will agree that it's been very creative. Where we've been innovative in the uh, fraud prevention sector, the forces have been very innovative too. Yeah. Yeah, I think those are all excellent points. Um, So sort of on a macro level, it feels like these regulations are making people feel more comfortable transacting online in general. So that helps everyone in the industry. And then on a micro level, it really helps your company 
understand what are the best practices and what do you really need to be doing in order to make sure that you are protecting your customers. So do you guys have proof that past regulations have positively impacted business sectors? Are there regulations that have already happened where we've seen some real positive benefits? Um, Hebrew, you want to start this time and then we'll go to Cameron? Yeah, so um, as you can see, this is something I'm very passionate about um, and I'm definitely advocate. Um, I've always um, advised that security and data enhancements is so important in, in making sure that we're safe online, where we actually have been trading unregulated for such a long period of time. And I think it is down to us as all of us network individuals that work in the online space to make sure that we self-regulate. And in terms of um, regulation that's worked really well is PCI regulation. So for anyone who's not familiar, that's payment card information regulation. This was mandated by a lot of um, acquiring and processing banks because of all the hacking and all the payment um, details just sort of being hacked and millions of card details being um, available in the dark web and to fraudsters to bulk buy. And this has been very successful in, in, in being a first stage to introduce to a lot of merchants trading online that, hey, you guys are collecting really valuable information. This is a, a tre treasure chest that your customers are giving to you and you need to do a lot to protect us. I mean, I don't know how you feel, Cameron, but if somebody gave me 5 million different individuals' transaction details that I could go ahead and process payments with, I'd be quite precious about that. And I think PCI was a, a great step in that direction. And I've always seen PSD2 as, you know, following on from that. It's from the same industry. It's from the same sector. It comes from the banks. And, and who are the banks? The banks represent our customers. They represent the people that we're trying to do business with. And we need to make them feel safe and secure and PCI wasn't so visible to the customer it was very much a merchant side um, security process but it's been very successful in implementing that kind of understanding within the merchants minds that actually I need to look after my customers details and protect them yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think, you know, we're talking about PSD2, but if you want to talk about a regulation that I think you can point quantifiably to a positive impact, look back at PSD1, um, which really set the table for this modern fintech revolution uh, that we are seeing blossom, uh, you know, the creation of the common, uh, you know, single European payments area. Um, really, I think, benefited both consumers and businesses alike by opening up the ability to have uh, cheaper payments, faster payments, more secure payments uh, between countries in Europe, and really, again, set the stage for, obviously, the rollout of PSD2. It's hard to have a two without a one. Um, but beyond that, really uh, got everyone aligned to the point where we could have uh, the modern fintech industry as we know it. Um, and this isn't necessarily a piece of regulation per se, but functioned in a similar way. I think the um, rollout of the liability shift in Europe, you know, got almost a decade earlier than we saw it in the US with regard to the EMV standard uh, can also be seen as a really positive impact. Um, you know, while for whatever reason, we still struggle to get our ducks in a row with uh, chip and pin here in the States. Um, in Europe, I think the adoption was a lot smoother. Um, it just exactly. works. And quite frankly, I think it positioned Europe extremely well for uh, being able to take a, a measure like PSD2 to layer on SCA because of um, consumer familiarity with the notion of kind of that strong authentication that's already built in. You know, when you use your credit card at a restaurant, instead of handing your a card to the waiter, them going off to the back and just swiping it and using the signature, which nobody, I mean, I haven't really signed my name on a credit card slip in it since I was like 16 and actually thought that it, you know, mattered. Um, you know, the notion that you have to punch in your pin code, I think really primed consumers to be um, ready to do SCA at a, at a broader scale. Yeah, I think those are both excellent points. And I, I sort of remember, I don't know, 15 years ago, I don't want to date myself too much here, but like 15 years ago, 20 years ago, like, you know, when the internet was 
kind of like a new thing. People were so scared to do any sort of shopping online. Nobody would have done banking online. And that's all really possible because some of this regulation came out and really forced businesses to be more secure and let consumers feel a lot more comfortable. So we've made a lot of progress since those days. Um, Okay, guys, let's take a question from the audience. Uh, so here's the question. Uh, we've seen a large uptick in fraud on our platform since the pandemic began, um, and it feels like we're not alone. So other people in our industry are, are talking about it as well. What effect do you guys think the pandemic will have on the future of regulation? Do you guys think the pandemic will have a specific uh, effect? Uh, Cameron, you wanna start? Sure, that's a great question. Um, on regulation, you know, I'm. I think it's fifty-fifty, but I think where we are going to see this ongoing impact is on consumer behavior. Um, the notion that folks who maybe were a bit loath to do things online, whether it's online banking, whether it's e-commerce, grocery delivery, alcohol delivery, um, all these. Uh, things that I think uh, people who were maybe going in person to do these tasks tried out platforms to do this remotely during the pandemic when they didn't want to go someplace in person, be around a bunch of other people, wait in line at the bank. Um, and that served as a, a nudge to kind of even, I think we were already on that acceleration curve of the digitization across every industry. Um, but COVID-19 and the quarantines really poured gasoline um, to accelerate uh, the growth of these trends. And I don't think um, we are going to go back for, for lack of a better word. I think these trends are here to stay. Um, I think while some folks are gonna kind of return to normal, I think a lot of people are realizing, hey, uh, I don't have to be stuck in my apartment anymore, but while I certainly don't wanna go take the precious time I do have uh, living my life and spend it waiting in line at the bank or, or whatever else. Um, and I think regulations are going to reflect this new shift, whether we see um, in other markets adoption of PSD2 like standards to protect consumers who are transacting online um, or the adoption of more GDPR like standards when it comes to um, how data can be captured, how it can be stored, how it can be used. I think we are going to see continued pushes in that direction across global markets. Um, I think it remains to be seen what direction that takes in markets like the U.S., um, you know, with the somewhat dysfunctional federal uh, government we have right now. I think you may actually see industry taking a lead, you know, with Apple, for example, um, on the new iOS update, cutting off access to a lot of data attributes um, to app uh, developers and less consumers consent uh, with Google and the industry kind of ending third party cookies as we know it. Um, I think you may actually end up seeing industry uh, being a leader in terms of nudging the space towards more consumer centricity, more privacy by design, um, more opt in data sharing. Um, you know, I guess that's not true regulation, but I think you, you'll end up in many ways with the same result um, because of this uh, intersectionality of what consumers want and what um, these tech companies that control these platforms are actually implementing. Gotcha. I mean, that's basically the perfect response. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we will see that and we will see a lot of um, people become quite aware, so, uh, aware of what's going on. Um, I don't know how you guys are um, seeing it, but I see a lot of uh, words that I've been using at work um, kind of go mainstream. So, you know, OTP messaging, oh, um, the secure um, two-factor. So a lot of social um, networks are promoting two-factor authentication in different ways, not related to PSD2, but it's, it's actually been delivered in exactly the same way. And I think what the fashion and the trend is towards bringing our offline and online worlds together. So it's this virtual world that people were apprehensive about. But if we can create connections to the real world, you know, we are now interacting with people's devices. We're now interacting with calls. And we're also seeing fraud in that space. And there's a big demand from customers saying, well, I do want to interact with you in this way, but I need you to do additional things to make me feel safe and secure. And a lot of merchants, a lot of businesses um, are finding that where they are making all of this visible to their customer, their customers learning to trust them better. A lot of um, people will agree that 
you know, when they go on a website, they they try to check this security and the regulation because it's kind of like, well, this is a massive world right now. It's so completely global. There is no borders online. So who's governing you guys? Who's regulating this? And I think that regulation has to be brought forward and the customers should be presented with these ideas. And we've always made this assumption they won't understand, they won't be interested in, but this has never been true. They are interested and they do understand. A lot of people read the terms and conditions. A lot of people want to know what you're doing with their information. This is now... Um, on mainstream media, it's on um, regular conversations between individuals day to day. Like I'm shopping online, but they they seem to be secure. They're taking care of me. I don't think someone else could have completed this transaction. I think it would have had to be me. And that's what the two factor authentication is really doing, isn't it? It's going to that omni global, omni channel. Um, business that we want to trade in because we want to merge our online and offline businesses where possible. We want to bring a presence to our day-to-day -day lives. So while people want to have a separate life while socializing, like you said, Cameron, if they want to do their banking, they want to be able to sort of go from their offline worlds using their devices and cards and payments and go on to the online world, transact in a safe space. And they, I think they want visibility of the regulation. That, that's what a lot of people assumed wasn't the case but everyone has liked that that's what actually creates trust that there is some kind of governing body that's minding all of us so we're not just trading globally and nobody is telling us what to do I think it's good to share this information with our customers and I don't think a lot of people will want to go back to this sort of I don't know what happens behind the scenes as soon as I pay I don't know what happens I think they want visibility of that and they want the offline um, journey to happen. So two factor is actually a great way of implementing that. It's been very successful. Awesome guys, really great responses. Okay, so let's uh, let's keep moving forward uh, and and let's jump to uh, the related but new talking point. So uh, speaking about PSD two specifically, we think it's going to be helpful to view the requirements of the mandate as a form of data enhancement. So for example, rather than introducing friction by asking your customer for additional information uh, at a critical part of the onboarding process or the checkout process, it's more advisable for merchants really to enhance the information that they're already collecting. So you can gain insights uh, by enhancing the data provided with processes like looking up information around the phone number, looking up information about the email, um, address intelligence, et cetera. So looking at two-factor authentication, which as you guys stated, has become the gold standard for security verification. How can this PSD2 data enhancement improve the online experience for everyone? And uh, Ibra, you wanna start and then we'll go to Karen. Um, okay. So I really believe in this because I think we've collected all of the information we could possibly ask people in the online registration, the, the forms. We really anticipated a world where we went to one touch and our devices knew exactly who we are in every way. But we're realizing that people don't like that. People do want to volunteer some information and hold some back. And so we've kind of um, got a few details that are reliable that we can work with and everything else should be collected behind the scenes and so asking for more information is actually necessary but it's it's creating this friction onboarding it's a it's a huge form and it puts people off and you know um device manufacturers have tried to come get around it so they're auto populating the information for the users and so really there is um a need for both and for balance. And I think data enhancement is the correct way to go. So we've got the set of information we're already getting, but what are we doing with that? So when we collect the email, what do you do with it? Do you know anything about that email? Are you looking into it? When you collect a phone number, okay, so you sent an OTP message. Beyond that, what have you done? And there's a lot of information, there's a lot of data enhancement available in the FinTech community. And there's lots of niche providers, I mean, 
if I could say so, us as well. We provide a lot of insight and we collaborate with a lot of companies. And there are lots of fintechs doing similar things in focusing in different data assets, which I call them. And I think the most important thing is to enhance those data assets and to understand what information can be gotten from that. So things like um, email fuzzy matching to, to try and understand would that make sense? It works in principle, but really and honestly, everybody's online and it's really difficult to find unique pieces of information from that email. And so we have to keep enhancing how we look at data and what that data means for that merchant in particular, for their demographic and to evaluate that. And that's where I think we need to focus on the data enhancement of the data assets we collect already without adding further steps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cameron? Yeah, uh, I mean, great points. Uh, not, no, uh, not much to add in terms of uh, what you said uh, around thinking about, look, uh, what are the intersectionalities of user experience and uh, fraud mitigation that we can most effectively tackle while complying with these new regulations? I think you know, and uh, I feel like a bit of a broken record because I feel like this conversation is cropping up uh, with all of my clients right now which is moving beyond this notion that user experience and fraud prevention must live um, in opposition to one another. And the notion that rather than identifying and punishing bad users, um, we should be in the business of identifying and you know coddling, for lack of a better word, your good users. Um, you should be identifying your trusted users, your repeat customers, um, the folks that all of their signals are telling you this is someone who's a legitimate consumer and waving them through the velvet rope section, um, as opposed to scanning through your line and looking for, you know, baddies um, to, to throw additional friction at. Um, and I think this notion of capturing a minimum amount of data where possible and then using kind of behind the scenes enrichment and metadata, other signals, um, like, you know, someone's uh, telecommunications data and footprint. So like, is this a trusted number? Have we seen them in a network before? Have they transacted before successfully? Um, and then use that to really enrich the consumer experience as opposed to treating everyone as suspect um, and, you know, quite frankly, losing dollars, losing business, because you are going to challenge a good consumer that's just going to end up throwing up their hands and saying, uh, you know, uh, I, you're asking me for all this. I'm just trying to buy a, you know, I don't know, some clothes on Amazon or whatever, and, and I'm out here. I don't want to uh, deal with this. And they'll either not transact at all, or uh, I mean, even worse, take their business to your competitor who has a well-designed flow um, and is putting the consumer experience first. And uh, you, you know, you may never get that customer back. A lot of times, you get one shot at at making a good impression with someone. Um, and if you don't make that good impression, one of your competitors, I guarantee you, uh, they will make that good impression and make the sale and keep that customer. Yeah, I think, I mean, those are all excellent points. And it's, the easier that we can make it for consumers while still stopping fraud, I mean, obviously, <laughs> obviously that is the holy grail, right, guys? Um, but uh, it's definitely becoming more and more doable by the day. So, uh, you know, that's the direction that everyone is going. Okay, so let's jump straight to another uh, audience question. Um, so regarding PSD2, how do I make sure my company is uh, ahead of the curve? Like how can we go beyond the requirements? Um, do you guys have any thoughts on that? I mean, I will be very brief about this. I think ultimately you need to innovate. The PSD2 regulation is actually open to more interpretation than people realize. A lot of the guidelines are suggestions. They have not been too specific about exactly what needs to be done. And I think now that the uh, legal requirements are out of the way and those departments are satisfied with the bare minimum, the FinTech departments and then the product teams and actually anyone who looks after onboarding a checkout needs to be given free reign to innovate and to explore different ways of evaluating the customer interactions with their company and um, find different ways of ensuring this is happening. And I think that, that that's what the next um, stage of this regulation is, to innovate and to get creative. Great. Cameron, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, look, 
taking um, user experience into account, building flows um, that can be both high security as well as low friction is going to position organizations well um, to stay abreast of these latest uh, regulatory changes. Um, you know, again, I think where step up authentication is required, um, or where I would want to put step up authentication in place, um, that's largely in line with where the regulations are calling it out. Um, so I think uh, from a, a business perspective, just thinking about, you know, how am I capturing uh, device level signals and how am I using the latest in technology to authenticate my customers in uh, a secure fashion is really going to position you well for what may be coming down the road next. Right, all excellent points, guys. So sort of uh, somewhat along those lines, uh, PSD2 is obviously a European regulation. So it really mostly applies to businesses that, are, that do business in the EU. Um, however, you know, we've seen, as we've discussed this entire time, like there is clearly a benefit to following these regulations, even if you're not in the EU. So what, uh, what incentive do you guys think there are for non-EU um, member countries across the globe to implement similar technologies? I mean, it, it, the answer is really easy. We've spent years painstakingly getting this right. And a lot of us got it wrong for so many times. And we spent a lot of time confused and trying to understand it. We've spent hours and days and weeks and years trying to perfect this. And really and honestly, what's different from our banking system to anywhere else in the world? What's different to consumer behavior that's different to anywhere else in the world with a bank card or a wallet? So what I'm saying is we've done all of the homework and we've learned everything that we need to. And personally, it's easier to adopt and adjust and make provisions for, you know, localization just to take into account what those country specific legal requirements are and, and the way people bank are, you know, Cameron, you said that people in America um, pay differently. So just taking those geographic differences into account, really, and honestly, I think this framework is really good. We've worked on it for years. And I think adopting it also means that where we all meet globally online, we can have a, a standard that everybody understands across all different cultures and languages, and it can become this one thing that we all understand in the online space while we trade in a global or local way. Yeah, again, I, I think we're in a uh, violent uh, agreement here. I think, uh, you know, in many ways, uh, forward thinking organizations that are not subject to PSD2 are already thinking about how can we implement um, essentially what would bring us into compliance, even without that mandate. Um, because, uh, again, you know, the balancing that notion of consumer experience with your uh, risk tolerances, I think is going to lead you in the direction of implementing similar um, functionality, similar requirements for uh, SCA as laid out in PSD2, even without that regulatory mandate. So, you know, I can't speak to the political climates globally. I think, you know, expecting meaningful progress to be made in um, some markets around these issues is probably not going to happen just because of how many other pressing challenges there are. Um, and maybe, you know, things like uh, SCA are not top of mind for regulators and uh, legislators. But I think uh, regardless of that, we are going to continue see, uh, seeing the adoption of these technologies because uh, consumers want it and leading um, players are going to be adopting it regardless uh, because of the prevalence of things like smartwatches, like biometrics in device, you know, you're going to continue seeing uh, adoptions of these latest technologies that essentially bring you uh, to a de facto PSD2 standard, even without that, uh, you know, regulatory teeth behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah, I totally agree. And sort of along the same lines as that. So here's an audience post question, really insightful question. So isn't PSD2 um, only applicable to merchants and card issuers. Does this affect other industries as well? Either one. 
Do you want to go first or? Go ahead, Cameron. Sure. Yeah. Um, so again, I'm not a lawyer. I just uh, tell people that I am a lawyer at bars for fun. Um, so this is not legal advice. Um, but my understanding is if you are um, processing payments, if you're taking payments above that de minimis threshold, um, that PSD2 would apply to you if you are dealing with a European customer. Um, so this is not just something that banks or other folks have to worry about. Now, naturally, if you're a retailer, you're probably going to have partners that are implementing um, you know, this payment stack with you who can help guide you. Um, but if you are doing uh, payments activity um, in the European Union, this is going to uh, bring you under the purview of that regulation. Yeah. Um, so in terms of what PSD2 and SCA is, like I've said before, social networks have um, implemented and adopted similar technology. So it's good to not look at it as like a, a single dimensional issue, but it's more about authentication and verification. If you leave the mandate behind, what are we trying to do? We're trying to identify that you are who you say you are. And I think across the whole world in the online space, the ideology has to be adopted by everyone who wants to have a presence and to look after their user journeys and experiences and actually the, the bottom line. So wherever there's mis, um verification and you're unable to verify your user, there are lots of implications in terms of, you know, um, social negative impact of, of being anonymous. I think that's what it basically represents. It's, it's bringing identity to the online space and verifying everyone you interact with. So I see SCA as not just a standard for EU and just for payments directive, but I see this as uh, the groundwork and the foundation of moving to a safe space online. Mm -hmm. Awesome, guys. And then there, we have one other audience post question. This one is I, I hopefully not hopefully not too difficult for you guys. So let me know if you have thoughts around it. So uh, what about distributed ledger technology as a replacement for PSD2? Do you guys have any thoughts around that? Well, um... You know, I guess it would not be a webinar in 2021 without having to talk about blockchain. So if you had, yeah. uh, if you had blockchain on your bingo card, cross that off, you're a big winner. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think maybe, I mean, look, you can do a lot of things with, with blockchain. Um, I don't know if, you know, SCA is necessarily one of them. I think from my understanding of kind of the current blockchain-based payments technologies, um, they're relying on like a single strong authentication factor um, as opposed to a multiple authentication factor. Um, and when I think of things like uh, cryptocurrency more broadly, um, user experience is maybe not one of the buzzwords that comes to mind. Um, so I think there are maybe opportunities for uh, intersectionality, but I think where PSD2 often is really focused is in these kind of traditional payment networks, you know, the credit card and bank uh, payments that are more prevalent. Um, and I don't necessarily see current generation blockchain technologies playing too much of a role, um, but I could be missing the, the boat here completely. Ibra, what do you think? <laughs> um interesting question and yes blockchain i'm pretty into as well and um i think like i said in the previous comments it's all about sort of our global world online matching together and some of these regulations actually creating the groundwork and it's about verification and audit trading so blockchain is basically ultimately trying to achieve um it's sca on steroids isn't it it's trying to achieve the ultimate audit trail online it's it's saying okay so there's a transaction of any kind, um, any kind of communication happening online, I'm going to track it and make sure there's lots of people watching it. And so that's basically what it's all about. And so, yes, um, I think all of these understandings and the stuff that I'm suggesting people innovate will help towards that. It will help towards creating an audited, a safe space online where we actually know who we're trading with, what we're interacting with, and there's somebody keeping tabs on everyone in a safe way without being intrusive. And that's what SCA is also doing as well. It's given a lot of control to the end user because we make a lot of decisions in the corporate space. 
and then just sort of roll these products out and then all these consumers have to deal with them. But really it's about SCA is bringing the consumers to the conversation, making them aware of what's going on online behind the scenes and giving them some kind of decision-making abilities and helping them protect themselves. So that's what SCA does, isn't it? It gives you the, the peace of mind that actually I'm involved in this journey. I'm making decisions. No one else could have transacted in this way. And this merchant is looking after me and making sure I'm involved in this way. So I think absolutely all of these um, different industries and different understandings will have to merge. And I think this is a really great way of working towards that. Awesome. Yeah, excellent answers, guys. Great. So we just have a couple of minutes left. So we're going to wrap it up really quick. What, uh, what do you guys want to leave the audience with? So just in 30 seconds or less, um, let's start with Cameron and then we'll go to Ebru. Uh, great question. I mean, I, I think the main takeaway here is you should not see this regulation as an unnecessary burden and rather than, um, you know, a bit of navel gazing and, you know, thinking, oh, I have to implement this and I'm just going to do it to tick the box. And I'm not going to think about how PSD2 fits in with my broader digital identity strategy. Uh, I think that's a missed opportunity. I think organizations should see this as an opportunity to really put digital identity front and center in their technology stacks. Um, think about how I can center user experience and digital identity uh, within my organization and maybe, again, use this as um, an opportunity, not as a burden, uh, to really springboard how you are thinking about the customer lifecycle, how you are treating that customer's digital identity as they move through the different phases of engagement. Um, and again, um, take advantage of this, the fact that, look, you do have to comply with this regulation. So there is going to be money that needs to be spent. There are uh, going to be shifts in how you are doing things um, and, and seize on this as an opportunity to really um, maybe make some changes that you otherwise would not have had the opportunity to do um, and really position yourself for the future. Use this as a springboard as opposed to thinking, oh, this is uh, you know a roadblock, an impediment, uh, a hassle to my organization. Great. Hebrew? So in terms of what I want to leave behind, I think, as I always say, innovate, look at the regulation, look what you've done, what, what was required and beyond that. Now, can we have some fun with it? And there's lots of departments that are now emerging uh, on the back of this. And if you put um, your interactions with the customer at the forefront of your business beyond everything else, so you're not just selling things online, you're a technology company now, I think that's what everybody needs to accept that while you trade online, you're a technology company first, and then whatever business you have is secondary to that. And so data is the biggest valuable um, asset you have in trading online. So follow the data, look at the inside. SCA has given you so much valuable data. So if you've gone beyond the, the mandated requirements, you can see that actually there's a lot of data that's been ultimately gifted to you. What is it telling you and what could you do in a positive way? Do you Can you pick out your good customers from there and give them a good experience? Can you understand the demographics of the people you're interacting with and the countries you trade with? And I think that's what the takeaway here is to innovate, look at the data, enhance the data, make sure you're verifying your users, make sure you understand who you're interacting with. And really, and honestly, it's all about KYC, know your audience, know your customer, and what better way of doing that by bringing them from your online space to the offline space and really bringing them into your life and creating lots of trust online and offline and protecting them and involving them in all of this. And I think some money has to be invested in this. This is something that's not happening. So I would, I would suggest that everybody put some money aside for this. And these are really good projects to work with, to innovate, to improve the user experience, to change the journey and to make a mark in the industry in this way by having the best possible user experience that's seamless, but it's safe. Your customers are aware of it. Your safety measures are visible, but easy to overcome. And I think it all comes down to understanding digital identities and data. Excellent points, guys, and really appreciate your time today on this webinar. I cannot think of two better experts to have on, on this type of webinar. You guys were awesome, so really appreciate you joining us.
and also same to our attendees. So thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up now. Uh, and again, thanks for joining. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.